good afternoon. Uh, my name's James O'Reilly. I'm the Bluetooth qualification expert for UL, uh, based in the UK. Uh, so we're just going to have a brief overview of the qualification and testing requirements. The agenda is just a brief introduction, an overview of qualification and testing, and a summary of what we've covered. So I hope that we, from this, what we will achieve is, as previously mentioned, an overview of qualification and testing requirements. What testing you may have to perform uh, to get your Bluetooth product fully qualified. And hopefully give you some pointers in the direction where you can hopefully save time and money when you go through the qualification process. I don't work for a manufacturer, um, and this is how I envisioned that you come around uh, developing a product. I'm sure it's probably wrong and there's a, it's a lot more complex, um, but I am gonna really concentrate on just one area. So obviously you come up with a product conception. I presume you go to the consumer market, see where there's a space for you to develop a new product, come up with a plan, determine what technologies, uh, what you plan to do really. Obviously a design, make sure the ergonomics of the product is what your customer really wants. Finally, before you come to testing, you come up with a prototype. So you've got this new product that you can't wait to get onto the market. And then there's something, there's a big barrier that holds you from starting to sell your product. And this is normally the regulatory and technology requirements. So to sell your product, you have to meet the regulatory and technical requirements uh, of your product to be able to sell your product in, in the regions you plan to sell it. We're gonna concentrate on the uh, Bluetooth requirements I'm sure many of you have already seen this slide. Um, as you can see, there's two routes that you need to uh, fulfill. Obviously, the technology requirements, but also the uh, regulatory type approvals that you have to meet for each country you plan to sell your product. So Bluetooth qualification. I'm kind of starting with questions that I'm sure we all have when we try and first qualify our product. We learn that there's a number of requirements, technology and regulatory requirements. And some of the first questions that come to my mind if I had to do a product were what requirements are mandatory? How long will it take? What is the cost? Uh, why do I have to do them? So I'm gonna try and hopefully answer a number of these questions uh, throughout the presentation. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think I'll answer all of them fully, uh, but if you have uh, any questions, please feel free to talk to me or a number of people here from test facilities or the Bluetooth SIG, I'm sure they can help you out. So the purpose, Bluetooth qualification. In my opinion, the real purpose of Bluetooth qualification is to for interoperability. It gives a, a great basis um, if you meet all the Bluetooth requirements. It gives you a good start to ensure that your product is interoperable when it gets to the market. Unfortunately, we know that it doesn't cover everything. I don't think any qualification program could do that. Um, but it's definitely the start. It also ensures that you meet the Bluetooth specifications and enforce compliance. So the Bluetooth qualification is a necessary prerequisite of gaining the Bluetooth intellectual property. You have to go through the process to obtain the intellectual property to use the Bluetooth technology in your product. But also with that, you get the use of the Bluetooth logos and start really showing that your product is a Bluetooth device and uh, Bluetooth is renowned throughout the world now. And having the Bluetooth logo is definitely a selling point for your product. So the goal of qualification, in my opinion, it's to obtain a QDL, Qualified Design Listing, and or an EPL and product listing. So this is kind of the end goal for any product that you want to sell, which includes Bluetooth in. But with that, if you know that you meet all the Bluetooth requirements and you meet all the requirements of the QDL or the EPL, the main result is that you'll have peace of mind. And that when you come to sell your product, that you won't have any problems, you won't have any feedback, you won't have the Bluetooth SIG asking you to do updates to your product or possibly even remove it from the market. So as mentioned, a QDL is one of your targets. So what is a QDL? So as mentioned, it, was a, it is a qualified design listing, and this is a unique Bluetooth design, uh, unique to your own product, 
um, that you have to then list because it's your own unique implementation of Bluetooth. With that though, to list your product, what you need is a QDID. A QDID is the Qualified Design Identifier, but in my opinion, it's just a serial number for your project. So your QDL is your actual product and your actual design. And the QDID is the serial number so you can list your product and people can reference that number and look up your product and how you've listed it. So there are a number of options of listing your product as a QDL. As you can see, there's seven up there. I'm going to concentrate on the first five and two to four, which are subsystems, kind of combine into one. So we're going to predominantly look at those. There is a number of test systems and development tools, but I would believe that predominantly, especially in this room, that uh, you would fall into one of the first five QDL. So before we go on to the different types of QDL, this is the percentage of QDLs that are being listed on the Bluetooth. And I'm always surprised that predominantly it's end products that have the largest percentage. I always think that the subsystems since their release uh, of PRD2 would certainly start to increase and if not, go beyond end products. But that hasn't been the case uh, and most people, especially if you're a small company, you're only going to develop one or two products. So normally you just want to do one QDL that, so you can list your product and set it with Bluetooth inside. The interesting one for me that I think we're going to see a big change in is profile subsystem. At the moment, it's a very small percentage, but since low energy and the gap-based profiles and uh, being implemented onto smartphones as applications and tablets, I think we're going to see a steady increase in profile subsystems over the next few years. So a component is a partial implementation of Bluetooth. It can be as small as a single test case, or it can be a complete stack, ranging from baseband to SDP. So it's a partial in implementation. It doesn't necessarily have to, well, it doesn't have to meet the minimum mandatory requirements of anything. It can just, as long as you can show you it compliant to one or two test cases or even protocols, then you can list your product. The more the component is compliant, the end product manufacturer can inherit all that testing that's already performed. So there's a number of components that are complete stacks and normally for end product manufacturers, a big problem is protocol testing. So if they're using a component from CSR or Broadcom, TI, uh, a number of other manufacturers, you can incorporate that component and you wouldn't have to perform any of the protocol testing as long as it's covered by the component already. And like if you had to develop your own stack and obviously you wouldn't have any inheritance and with a qualified stack, hopefully you would have lots of inheritance and greatly reduce your testing. So sus subsystems came in a number of years ago now, uh, since the release of PRD2, and they, they are intended to help reduce qualification costs, uh, qualification listings. Subsystems are also a partial implementation of Bluetooth, but they meet the minimum mandatory requirements of either the controller, the host, or profile. So the controller would be the RF, baseband, link manager, and HCI. And to list your product as a controller subsystem, you would have to meet the minimum mandatory requirements for those protocols for a specific course specification. And for the host a subsystem, you would have to meet the minimum mandatory requirements for HCI, GAP, LTCAP, and SDP. If you do this, and then combine them together in, within your product, as they meet all the mandatory requirements and you haven't made any changes to it, you shouldn't have to do any additional qualification testing as everything's already been covered. So we would always highly suggest that you do some verification testing because you don't necessarily know what changes may have happened when you were incorporating the subsystems into your product, but actual qualification testing is no requirement. So this greatly reduces listing costs. So in, uh, before PRD2, you would have to do a new qualification for each laptop, for example. So you would use the same controller, you would use the same software, the same host, and the same profiles in each laptop, but it would be different, it'd be a different style of laptop, for example. 
So you'd have to do a different QDL for each. However, if you did a host subsystem and a controller subsystem and implemented the same module and software in each laptop, you'd only have to do two listings rather than 20 or 30. Then the final type of uh, listing were QDL, uh, which is still the most prominent uh, listing, is an end product. So an end product listing is a QDL that meets all the minimum uh, mandatory requirements for any core specification that you've implemented in your product. So also mentioned, uh, with a QDL, you have to do an EPL. Well, if you've got an end product. EPLs are free of charge. They are the way that the Bluetooth SIG can track Bluetooth devices. So since the introduction of subsystems, you can just combine them and come up with an end product. There's no way to track what devices, Bluetooth ha uh, what devices have Bluetooth in it. So they came up with the EPL. So it's free of charge. Uh, it's a mandatory requirement. You have to do it, Bluetooth SIG. But there is no qualification requirement, as mentioned previously with the subsystem as long as you've incorporated it correctly uh, and haven't changed any of the subsystems or previous end product. Also, there are a number of benefits of having an EPL. When you're shipping your product, uh, quite often they'll be stopped at customs and check that they meet the, man uh, the requirements of the technology or the regulatory requirements that the product is going to be sold in. So having it listed on the Bluetooth SIG, obviously the customs can lick it up, make sure that it's all qualified correctly and hopefully let it through without any problem. But also it's a great place to start showing off your product. The Bluetooth SIG have a Bluetooth showcase. Um, this is where you can upload pictures, uh, a detailed description, and really start showing off your product. This is kind of the start. Uh, I, don't get me wrong, I'm sure you would do additional advertising, but anyone who is really in, uh, enthusiastic about Bluetooth will often go on the product sh showcase to see what Bluetooth products are on the market. A large percentage of Bluetooth qualification can be done in-house. The PTS tool is very accessible from the Bluetooth SIG, uh, so you can download it free of charge so you can perform all your own profile testing. There is a number of protocol testing you can do, but normally the limitation with that is the test tool is so expensive. So protocol testing isn't normally viable within house unless you have a very large budget and you have uh, a number of devices coming through. So you can do that in house. Uh, also a problem with that is you may not have the experience or the staff or the resources to do testing in house. But it is possible if you want to. The other is obviously seek advice. So there's numerous test facilities globally now. So there should be one in your local area. Um, these are BQTFs and these have been recognized by the Bluetooth SIG to be able to perform uh, competently qualification requirements for profile, protocol, and RF, or uh, a subset of those. So it could be that they only support RF, or they only support profile. Uh, UL in the UK do all three. We do protocol, RF, and profile. Also, you can contact BQEs. There's a number of BQEs that have been recognized by the Bluetooth SIG that can help you through the qualification process. So they can help you set up your project. They can help you determine what test requirements you have to perform and even and perform the testing for you if required.